there. Come in. Over. Things you didn't know about the Apollo program. Hey everyone, it's Alexa, and welcome back to another video. We all know the Apollo name and recognize the program as the one that took us to the moon. But what about some of these smaller, lesser known details about these missions? The astronauts who participated in the program experienced and saw more than most know. So we've gathered some of the more exciting things about the Apollo missions for you. But before we get into today's video, make sure that you're subscribed and ring the bell so that you never miss any of our upcoming videos. Project Astronaut. At one time, originality didn't seem to matter all that much to the United States, NASA, or the Space Task Group. This was apparent when the first manned satellite program was nearly named Project Astronaut. The agencies believed that the name would really emphasize the whole man and the satellite thing, but we sure are glad they did not keep the designation, because it sounds like something out of a cheesy science fiction movie. The name was eventually discarded after it was deemed that it overemphasized the personality of the man. Mercury, the name which the project finally received, worked well because it was familiar to the American public at large. This was due to the automobile by the same name, the heavy metal found in things like thermometers, and probably the most obvious, the planet. Planet. NASA and the Space Task Group also liked the whole Mercury messenger of the gods thing, and it was from this program that the tradition of using mythology to find names for space programs was born. Dang it, Johnny! Did you know that initially, the intention of the Apollo program wasn't to take us to the moon? Well, it kind of was, but we weren't originally going to land on it. The project was announced in 1960, and the goal, as stated, was to send three men into space and have them orbit around the space rock not land on it. Then, on May 25, 1961, good old John F. Kennedy addressed Congress and stated that he had a national goal, and that goal was landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. To achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The Apollo program dedicated itself to the goal and worked tirelessly to accomplish Kennedy's dream by the end of the 60s. It was an incredibly ambitious goal, considering at the time of Kennedy's address, only two people had ever even been into space. Yuri Gagarin, a Soviet cosmonaut, was the first, and about a month later, American Alan Shepard made the journey past Earth's atmosphere as well. Cover your ears. The launch of a crewless vehicle called Apollo 4 was intended to test out a 363-foot-tall rocket named Saturn V. The launch happened on November 9, 1967, and was the first ever launch at the Kennedy Space Center in Brevard County, Florida, a location now synonymous with shuttle launches and space in general. NASA has stated that the sound produced by the launch was one of the loudest human-made noises ever. Buildings three miles away experienced tremors from the launch, and it even caused all kinds of dust and debris to rain down on the control center from the ceiling. The mission was a success. The rocket didn't fall apart, and NASA was able to glean valuable information about support facilities and the overall structural integrity of the rocket. Apollo 6 was a disaster. An unmanned craft was launched as what was dubbed Apollo 6, and various things went wrong with it but it went relatively unnoticed. This launch was also meant to test Saturn V, and it was the final unmanned test NASA would do. Not long after takeoff, in the second and third stages, the craft began experiencing what is known as pogo oscillation, which is basically just an internal vibration caused by combustion instability. This caused two second-stage Rocketdyne J2 engines to completely shut down before they were intended to. This caused the parking orbit of the craft to become far more elliptical elliptical than what had been previously expected, and a third stage engine that was also damaged due to the vibrations failed to restart, not allowing for an attempt at a trajectory correction. Overall, NASA considered the mission a success because it learned invaluable knowledge about the Saturn V from it, but that doesn't explain why the partial failures didn't gain more attention. Well, the test just happened to come four days after Lyndon Johnson stated that he would not seek re-election and on the day of Martin Luther King's assassination. The program was a hit on TV. The first ever Apollo mission to stick people inside a craft and send them into space was Apollo 7. The mission also featured another amazing first, and it helped to connect the public at large more personally to the project. It was the first mission to feature live television transmissions sent back to Earth. 
The Wally, Walt, and Don Show was what the broadcasts were called. They featured Walter Shira, R. Walter Cunningham, and Don Isall, the three astronauts aboard Apollo 7. They cracked jokes throughout and even gave a tour of their home far, far away from home. And Walter Shira was heard saying that he was going to try for an Emmy for the best weekly series. Maybe Shira was a clairvoyant, or perhaps the transmissions from outside of our world just inspired people. But the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences gave Apollo's seven, eight, nine, and 10, a trustees award in 1969. Apollo 8 got NASA in a little hot water. Apollo 8 was doing its thing, just circling around the moon when the holiday season came around. On December 24th, 1968, the crew took the Earth Rise photo, which is one of the most famous photographs of the Earth ever taken. The astronauts, Bill Anders, Frank Borman, and Jim Lovell were given instructions to quote unquote, do something appropriate for those tuned in and listening to what they were up to. So they did what many would have done back in the day. They opened their Bible and recited a passage from Genesis. Madeline Murray O'Hare, a famous atheist, decided it was a good idea to sue NASA over the reading, saying it violated her First Amendment rights. The case was eventually dismissed, but it changed things for the space agency in the future. During Apollo 11, astronaut Buzz Aldrin had wanted to read a communion passage to those listening on Earth, but was told not to because of the problems Apollo 8 had faced. The flag was highly debated. We all know the images. The American flag being planted on the moon and proud astronauts standing nearby. Well, did you know? The decision to bring that flag and erect it on the moon was a tough one to make, and it almost didn't happen. The Outer Space Treaty was active at the time, and President Nixon stated that we should go to the new worlds together, not as new worlds to be conquered, but as a new adventure to be shared in his inaugural address in 1969. So why would we put an American flag on the moon if we were all gonna be at this whole space travel thing together? It was suggested that a United Nations flag be used instead of the American flag, but that idea was passed on. There were concerns about the type of message planting an American flag would send, mainly one of us potentially trying to gain control of the moon, but those were pushed aside. In the end, the American flag was used, and it was said to emphasize that Americans came in peace for all mankind. Speaking of the flag, that first flag planted on the moon by Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong has a sort of mysterious origin. What we mean is that nobody seems to really know exactly where it came from or who made it. NASA stated at the time that multiple flags had been purchased from different stores in Houston for the landing, thus making it hard to pinpoint exactly where it came from. All identifying markers and labels were removed prior to its planting, but questions and speculation came soon after it was planted. It's been said that three secretaries were sent out during their lunch hour to purchase the American flags from different stores, but that all three ended up at Sears, where Annan and Company was the official flag supplier. However, a NASA executive named Jack Kinsler was unable to verify the information and story, but according to his notes, the flag may have been purchased for $5.50 out of the government stock catalog. Apollo 12 became a lightning rod. Did you know that during takeoff, Apollo 12 was struck by lightning twice in 16 seconds? The astronauts on board, Richard Gordon Jr., Charles Conrad, and Alan Bean, said they felt something strange before things started to get a little wacky. The craft had been hit just 36 seconds after taking off, and then it was hit yet again at 52 seconds, and nobody even realized it. The astronauts just knew that something had happened, so they decided to try and wait it out. The electrical systems ended up up needing to be reset, and within 25 minutes, everything went right back to normal. Well, almost everything. The automated navigation aboard the craft was broken, and the crew did need to fire up its main engine to get out of Earth's orbit into the moon. They got the engine going. Alan Bean whipped out star charts while Richard Gordon Jr. used a sextant, and the space explorers manually navigated to get to where they were going there's still an ongoing experiment on the moon. It's been quite a while since we last visited our moon's surface, but there are several pieces of equipment left up there by Apollo 11, 14, 15, and some Soviet rovers that are still giving us information. We're talking about little two-foot panels that are made up of 100 mirrors, which are part of the Lunar Laser Ranging Retro Reflector Experiment. Basically, giant lasers are aimed at the panels, and then they take a shot. By the time the light gets to the moon, the beam has a diameter of 4.3 miles. That beam then reflects off of the panels and travels back to Earth, where, when it reaches us, the diameter is 12.4 miles wide. Scientists use the data from the lasers to determine our moon's movement in comparison to our planet, and they've found that, on average, it moves away from us at a rate of one and a half inches a year. 
We've learned a lot of interesting stuff about the Apollo program, and we still have one more interesting fact to go. But first, we'd like to ask, what are your fondest memories of humankind's venture into space? Was anyone watching around when these missions were going on? What about for subsequent programs? We'd love to hear what excites you about space travel in the comments below. What comes after being an astronaut? When astronauts come back from space, what do they do? As it turns out, they do a number of things. Edgar Mitchell chose to look into various psychic phenomenon. Michael Collins got in with the National Air and Space Museum, where he became its first director. Harrison Schmidt went on to become a senator for New Mexico. Buzz Aldrin, one of the very first men on the moon, worked in Los Angeles as a, uh, salesman at a Cadillac dealership. He has said that he wasn't very good at it, though, and in fact spent more time talking to people about space than cars. In his memoir, Magnificent Desolation, he says, I spent more time signing autographs than anything else. In fact, I didn't sell a single car the entire time I worked there. Kind of comical, isn't it?